Get ready for a once-in-a-lifetime gathering. The legends of Oklahoma football. 33 of the all-time greats from the 1940s to the 21st century. Six decades of Oklahoma legends, including Claude Arnold, Bob Berry, Bo Bollinger, Brian Bosworth, Buddy Burris, Tony Casillas, Leon Cross, Eddie Crowder, George Cumbie, Steve Davis, Ricky Dixon, Jimbo Elrod, Bob Harrison, Keith Jackson, Merv Johnson, Bill Kreischer, Buddy Leak, Ken Mendenhall, Jack Mildren, Jay O'Neill, Greg Pruitt, Jim Riley, Jakey Sandifer, Dewey Selman, Billy Sims, Barry Switzer, Jerry Thompson, Spencer Tillman, Jerry Tubbs, Uva Von Schaman, Bob Warback, Joe Washington, Steve Zabel. It's the stories, the lives, the championships, the losses, the coaches, but most of all, the legends talking about their love for Oklahoma football. Now settle back. It's the first quarter, and it's kickoff time. With all the success that you guys have had, there's only one of us in this room right now who's wearing two wristwatches. Why? Because he can. I guess he's got all the extra money. Might as well. Now, Spencer, what's the deal? Are you just trying to show us up for the extra wristwatch or what? No, I'm not. I'm not trying to show anybody up there. I'm, I'm serious. I'm gonna pass the mat for all you. What's, what's the deal on that? Um, th that's a sobering thought. I mean, I don't know if that's the kind of story to start this off with, but I shared this with Coach Switzer, and I've since shared it with Keith uh, a while back in an event that he had me come speak to in April. And uh, I don't know if you remember, Coach, but this was in, in Dallas. You were still with the Cowboys at the time. And uh, I had an experience where I was sitting in the Marriott Hotel lobby watching, um, it was New Year's Eve, getting ready to do one of the games. I can't remember if it was Northwestern, Tennessee, Florida Citrus Bowl, and Kenny Smith, who is the uh, TNT guy, one of your cohorts now, even though in a different sport, walks up behind me and slaps me on the back of the neck and says, what are you doing? And I was just sitting there by myself, just watching it. It was about 11.58. Dick Clark was doing his deal with the, the bowl, everything coming down. And I looked up there, and I said, that's interesting. It reminded me of something. There's a quote by Zorn Kierkegaard. And he said that uh, all of us must make noise on New Year's Eve to drown out the macabre sound of grass growing over our graves. It was better when we had hourglasses. The clocks deceive us, but we had to invent them, but we needed the deception. For the rotating hands give us the illusion that time goes on forever. And meanwhile, we curse the hourglass because indeed it's a constant reminder that time is truly running out. And so one of these watches doesn't work. It stopped. Time run out. It's just a constant reminder that when we come together like this, these are rare moments. You got to bring it all in, suck it all in, never let it go. So that's why I wear two watches. That's a great story. I'm not a pimp or nothing. <laughs> I actually thought you, actually thought you, yeah. you, you stole it and you were going to sell it. That would have been my 1746. I think it was the Argonauts, somebody like that. I don't know who it was. <laughs> hey, little Joe, how's, how's your knee doing, by the way? Little Joe, how's your knee doing? I, that, no, I'm, that's pretty I'm, tough coming out here. What, day after surgery? Day after surgery. The truth. I sneaked out. Did you? I just left him and told him I was gone. Mm. But they made me, you know, uh, you know, at least sign a release. You know, of course, the old release. Mm -hmm. Make sure I tear my crutches around a little bit, but yeah. wouldn't miss it for the world. How many operations was that? Ten. Wow. Mm. Ten. I saw you opted for the silk, the, the gray instead of the silver shoes. Well, right? you know what? I, I figured if I go, if I go, if I go silver. I might forget. <laughs> I might forget. Flashback. Yeah, I might have a flashback and tear up something else down here. But no. what do you think, Bob? Since we're taping this on Sunday, should we sit back now for the gospel according to Barry? Right, and, exactly. Uh, Coach Switzer. Oh, yeah, I was just trying to reflect on the silver shoes. I've forgotten about that. You know, when we recruited a little Joe out of Port Arthur, Texas, that uh, I was told that the guy had a bag of shoes he carried with him. And most of them were silver, and whatever school he went to. 
that he was going to have to play with those silver shoes. Well, I'd already heard Daryl said, hell, he's going to wear what we wear. And I heard that they said that up in Colorado and wherever else. And I said, I hadn't seen tape the guy yet. Well, I looked at the film of the guy, and I said, I don't care if someone's played barefoot or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just give him the ball. <laughs> it did have a lot to do with my, my coming to Oklahoma, being able to wear silver shoes, because at that time, we're talking in the early 70s, everybody wore black shoes. And, you know, you may have a few, you know, players, you know, wide receivers, quarterbacks or whatever, you know, they might spat their shoes or they may wear white shoes. But at Oklahoma, everybody wore white shoes. Linemen, the coaches, I mean, I say, hmm. So you're all into styling, huh? Oh, absolutely. That's hey, I, hey I, knew, I knew if nothing else, I was going to get to wear 24, going to play with, uh, play with the same backfield with Greg Pruitt and get to wear silver shoes. So I say, life is good. <laughs> can't get any better than that. You know, I look around the room, and uh, I think about what a great tradition we're all a part of. You know, and, and, I, and I commented before the show started that the one guy that started all this and I think about is, is Budge Wilkinson, your coach. And these guys over here sitting around, that, most of them are sitting on that side of the room. There's one of them behind me here. Started this thing back in the late 40s and early 50s uh, after the war when the Oklahoma didn't have much to be proud of. And the president of the University of Oklahoma, George Cross, and some other people in the regents thought that maybe they ought to do something good uh, for the state of Oklahoma when something needed to be done good. And... Uh, and it was the time it was right, and the war was over, and, and uh, a lot of guys coming back out of the service, and I've met many of them. They're not here today. I uh, wish they could be, but we're the, we represent them. And uh, I know their story, and you know their story well, because they were your teammates and you played with them. I wish Bud was here, and I truly do, because I reflect on my career and how my success was enhanced because what you guys accomplished. I had a great run at Oklahoma. And the reason why, Eddie, Art and Claude, Buddy, Leon, was because of what you guys did, Bill, at, uh, at Oklahoma. Because when I went in to sell my program, hey, they knew what I was selling. I had a vehicle, I had a product to sell because of what Bud, Dr. Cross, and you players were able to accomplish in your careers. Coach Switzer, you said after one of the, the Orange Bowl victory, I said that, that you even the record with, with Bud. And I think Coach Stoops, don't you, uh, don't you guys think Coach Stoops Drew on what, your success and also Bud's? I think he's embraced that. I think that's the smartest thing. When he came to town, I said, this guy's got it together because he's doing all the right things. Not because of what I would have done. It's because it was the right thing to do. And, and he's a smart guy, and he embraced all the family and the tradition and, and brought everybody back, made everybody be proud to be a, an Oklahoma Sooner football player. We, every program has its up and downs, and we've all fight through right. tough times. But uh, those t things are behind us. And... Uh, Bud had a great run. Uh, I had a great run, and the Stoops is going to have a great run. So it's uh, we're we're a part of something that's it's been great in college football. Well, we you all guys be talk, proud. Tell a story about Bud. Or hey, when you, me, can I say or? something for a minute? It's amazing because he brought up Bob Stoops. And um, what, what year was that that they played Arkansas in the Orange? I mean, in the uh, Cotton Bowl a couple of years ago. Yeah, and I was sitting up talking to Stoops' uh, family. And it was right, I think a year later, they offered Stoops the job at Florida or something. They were talking about leaving. And I mentioned to uh, Stoops' brother, I said, you know, uh, Bud and Barry made a great run, and I, I feel that Stoops could do it. And it seemed like he's on that way, so. Do you think the young guys of today embrace the history? Do they know the history? Uh, you know, I look at it from where I live. How about in Oklahoma? Do the young guys of today Really I don't think 17, it. 18, 19 year olds appreciate till they get older like us and know what they're really truly a part of. They're about winning. Don't me, you all think, Eddie? Well, let me just mention <clears throat> I'm in Colorado and been there for a long time. <clears throat> the things that uh, are being done by the University of Oklahoma to embrace those of us who played a long time ago are so much better than they do at other places. I, there are some places I'm sure do, like Notre Dame and so on, but the extension of the tradition that's being extended to us as long time ago guys is better at Oklahoma. Than, and <clears throat> I, I am treated a whole lot better at the University of Oklahoma than I am by the University of Colorado. And, and that's understandable because I live right there and I'm a part of that thing in an ongoing way, but 
Oklahoma reaches out to its former people, and I think that's bringing it back to the young players so that they are getting an appreciation like the All-America Weekend they had. Yeah, my hat's off to Joe Castiglione. I Absolutely. think Joe and, uh, of course, he and Bob Stoops seem to have a great relationship, and I know I think, I don't know if this was Joe's idea about that first game, that flashback to the 60s and the 50s <laughs> there, but I know Bob embraced it and just made it a great weekend, though. Those of everybody that was there uh, could feel and enjoy that, uh, you know, and like Eddie said, that you could feel the reaching out to us, making us feel yeah. part of it, and it was great. Wish the hell I'd been there. I've been, I was in the Amazon River. <laughs> <laughs> I would have swam back. It was raining hard enough. You could have been swimming that day. You know, we got a guy sitting here that's accomplished, and I, I don't know if my guys, I say my guys that played for me over here, uh, uh, realize what Jay O'Neill did at quarterback at the University of Oklahoma, what his career was like. And I don't know if it's true or not. You all know that little Joe, that in junior high school, he never lost a football game. High school, he never lost a football game. He went to the University of Oklahoma and never played in a damn losing football game. He never has experienced losing ever a football game. Then I became a coach. <laughs> yeah. hey, 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 Steve became the coach. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, the guy sitting behind you, Jerry Tubbs, is in the same boat from Breckenridge. Is that right? Lost one, one in high school and none in Oklahoma. And, it lost uh, one in high Lost two. But well, it's all right, you know. I mean, that's coach's fault. Goes right? on, that's players is coach's fault. <laughs> that's Joe Kerbel's fault, right? Right. <laughs> Jimbo, you want to jump? Barry, there's there's two guys here that were part of that after the war thing. Buddy, great story, and Claude Arnold, and and boy, it'd be great for these guys to hear those stories because I, hear it. Yeah, I was yeah, a junior yeah, high kid yeah. going to Norman on Saturday morning. Because if you roll your letter jacket, they let you sit down in the end zone. Of course, in September, it's hotter than hell, and you're just sweating <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but to watch these guys play was just absolutely fabulous, and, and I'd really love for these guys to hear some of those stories. They're really great. Buddy? Well, I'll tell you what, fellas. You overlooked the best shots we had there in Norman all this time. George Cross. Yeah. Yep. And he was one of the reasons we had that glue that kept us together. Now, I have tried to say this to some people down there at OU, and I don't know that they li listen to me very much, because I hope I, mean, I wouldn't listen to me either. But <laughs> George Cross had a lot to do with our football success back there in those days. He was for the program, and he was for the coaches, and he was for the men. And every time you looked around, he had a chance. He'd be out there on the practice field. He, I remember taking pictures, and he'd be there. And I was surprised a lot of times. Texas games, or bowl games. George Cross was usually right there in front of everybody. And I think we got a president down here now that's going to be that way, I hope. You don't know, time will tell. Yeah. Jimbo, you want to jump in before? Yeah, I don't think any of the links between our traditions is stronger than Oklahoma because it's just a small story, but we were getting ready to go play uh, Michigan in the Orange Bowl, get a shot at the national championship, and I get this letter, and it's from Eddie Crowder. And uh, he just congratulated, he's at Colorado then, congratulated me, uh, you know, praise me and, and just, you know, I'm saying, what, what is this, you know? And, and, and it just made me feel, you know, part of this family and how it extends, you know, throughout the United States. So and I still have that letter to this day at my mother's house. I forgot about it. I think it was, probably was a violation of the rules. <laughs> <laughs> You probably, you probably had P.S. if you're thinking about transferring, you'd be accepted. <laughs> yeah, that would be a violation. I, I, I was going to be more subtle than that. That was an unspoken given. <laughs> and, and since we're talking about Eddie, uh, I grew up in Colorado and, and wanted to play football at Colorado in the worst way. And Eddie didn't want me, so I ended up at Oklahoma. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Another unsolicited testimonial right there, huh? I want to talk about Coach Wilkinson. You know, I, I, I've only known the man by reputation from a distance. Uh, wherever you go, when you do series like this, the guys want to talk about Bear Bryant, about Era Parsegian, whatever school you're at. Let's talk about the coach a little bit. The, uh, no, everybody knows the X's and O's. That was outstanding. What kind of a human being? Could, I, be? could I comment on that? Please? Because I had the good fortune, as Claude did and others, Jay and so on, if you're a quarterback, well, you've got a lot of very personal private time with Bud Wilkinson because he's going to coach the quarterbacks and let them call the game themselves. But way beyond just that, and 
something that I believe and observe during the time but didn't have a full appreciation as I did as years went by is that Wilkinson set a standard that I think Barry carried on and I think Bob Stoops is now and that is this coaching is best done if it complies with the greatest definition of love love is patient and love is kind and Wilkinson had patience and kindness that prevailed over temperamentalism or anger or frustration or perplexity and Barry did the same and I think Stoops is doing the same and you see coaches with all other kinds of reputations doing the thing differently and it's never as effective as has been proven at Oklahoma with three of the greatest records in the history of college coaching Bud and Barry and now Bob Stoops and I think that's kind of the standard that has prevailed there and it expresses itself in the camaraderie that all of us feel. Was he a father approach? Was he a taskmaster kind of a guy? No, he was just a leader friend to me. Really? I, I didn't. My experience with Bud, of course, was when I played for him, I've never known a, a more gentleman than he was. Uh, he would stand outside as we were getting on the buses and people would want his autograph and he'd sit there and talk with them and sign the autograph and to the last person. And he was always a gentleman everywhere he was. I, I think it's very interesting as he would uh, go to the interviews with the, with the uh, newspapers and all, and they'd all sit there and they'd listen to him. After the Orange Bowl, I remember it very well. He was there, all of the reporters were around him, they was talking to him, and he was telling them about this or that. We'd beat Maryland 7 nothing in the Orange Bowl or whatnot. And I, I walked away, it was kind of coming out of the dressing room, and I heard some of the reporters talking. They said, boy, Bud Wilkinson is so great. He's just fantastic, but what did he say? <laughs> I thought that was a great, great illustration of a coach talking to the press, and not they thought he was really a great guy, but they said, "What did he really say?" <laughs> and Bud really had that that knack of uh, being a, a, a neat gentleman, and let the assistant coaches take all of the, get all the bad bad stuff, and he was the nice guy. Sure, he was. I, I got uh, I was fortunate. I got to be associated with him for seven of his 17 years. I was a player and got to be on the staff a year, but the thing that I always was amazed, and later on in life, looking back, <clears throat> were the people that liked to be associated with him, like John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy. I mean, uh, then you see people like, I remember the first time I saw him, he was at the Army game, he was a senator, but he became friends with Bud, and he really liked him. He made him his, I guess, director of physical fitness, wasn't it, yeah. throughout, the, throughout the country. One day, we're after a game, I look and I see this gentleman walking around with Bud and he's introducing him. His name is Ben Hogan, you know? A guy that I've always heard about. He's a legend. And, but this was what always impressed me was the types of people that, that migrated and, and that were associated with him. He was just amazing. That bring, reminds me of a, an amazing story from my vantage point as the broadcaster under Bud. Uh, and by the way, that's the biggest thrill of my entire life, business-wise, uh, when Bud named me the announcer in 61. But when President Kennedy was assassinated, we were driving up the turnpike to the Nebraska game. We stopped for lunch on the Kansas turnpike. The reason we drove the weather was bad. We couldn't fly a private plane. When we heard about the assassination, then all the way up from there to Lincoln, we were hearing about the Nebraska leg legislature maybe canceling the Nebraska football game. But we w drove on up there as well, and... When we got there, found out they were definitely going to play the game because Bud had talked to Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby's told Bud that he thinks uh, President Kennedy would want the game to go on. So we broadcast the game, and the most unusual broadcast of my mm. miserable career. <laughs> uh, the stadium, of course, was full at uh, Nebraska, although they weren't very good that year. And, uh, but during each commercial break in our broadcast, we played funeral music rather than commercials. We told the stations uh, before the broadcast that they could play commercials if they wanted to, but the network was uh, suspending all commercials and we played funeral, uh, funeral music. And it was most unusual crowd because they cheered but really didn't cheer. Everybody was sort of stunned at what had happened. But uh, I just thought that was a, a classy thing for Bud, of course, to, to confer with the Kennedys to see whether or not to play the game. Most unusual situation. And people don't realize either uh, what uh, Coach Switzer said about Bud. You know, when I was in school in the late 40s, uh, on Saturdays, people said, boy, I bet you had trouble getting tickets. Nah, never. You, you know, go get, want to go to the game today? Yeah, let's go. Walk in the stadium, about 30, 35,000 uh, people there. And Bud wanted to enlarge the stadium. They said, well, what do you want to enlarge it for? You can't fill it the way it is. So what I'm saying is, he started all this. He got the thing going. And that is a tremendous deal. And one other thing, then I'll shut up here for the moment. 
Barry is the greatest coach I've ever been around who will talk to the media and say something. <laughs> hey, hey, Merv, talk to, tell us a bit. We've started, Bob was just saying how this started, this, this changes, this develops, and so on. You've been around. You've, you have been, you're the guy. You've too been long. there. Yeah. Uh, too not long. too long, no. You've, you've, you've made a, a heck of a life out of it. Does the football program change significantly from administration to administration, or does the tradition and the, and the pride and all just basically carry it on through? No, I don't think that tradition and pride can carry it through without the man at the top, you know, embracing the past and acknowledging that it's really important to him and his program, and certainly Barry did a great job of that. And, uh, and of course, you talk about Barry, the thing that <clears throat> makes people in Oklahoma love Barry so much is the fact that he's going to say what he thinks. Uh, he's going to tell you how he feels. And most of us are guarded and careful in what we say. And, and of course, the, the people love him because he says what he thinks. And sometimes it upsets you, but most of the time you really appreciate the fact that he's honest and candid with you. And Bob Stoops is, is very much the same way. Uh, Bob, uh, I don't think Bob ever admitted uh, going in to play anybody that he didn't have an awfully good chance to win. I mean, that's the way he feels. And certainly his, his ability to embrace... Uh, what's gone on in the past and the tradition and bring to me and bring guys like Barry and J.C. Watts and others that are around in Norman now to visit with the squad every August. I think Spencer's been there and done that. I know Keith has. And uh, they come in and, and talk to the squad and tell them a little bit about what's gone in the past. And I think our squad has a much better knowledge of what's transpired in the way of tradition at Oklahoma than many of you might think because they're educated on it almost on a daily basis. But during the interim of the 90s, we had some leadership that did not do that, and we suffered. And so I think that's why one reason why Bob Stoops is bright enough to realize that has to be done. Eli? Bob, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me, but I went there as a freshman in 1953 and stayed till 65. So I was there from as a player and a coach. And as a player, Eddie mentioned it, but Bud was so detailed. I mean, you're, you're at a time when you're playing offense, defense, and the kicking game. The same guy's got to do it all. So when you talk about getting organized for practice, you think about how do you do that? How do you get prepared to play a game? And we never lost a game because we weren't prepared. But as a quarterback, we spent several hours a week with him. And by the time the game came around and we were calling the plays, I mean, it was like it was automatic. I mean, if we got in this situation, we knew what he wanted us to call. And, and he was much broader than just a football coach. I mean, his, his, his interests went lots of places, and he got involved, of course, with President Kennedy and, and organized that entire athletic program. He had his Coach of the Year clinics things and lots of other things that uh, uh, didn't have to do with football. But what I became so appreciative of was how well organized he was and how organized we were uh, as a football team because you only had two hours to practice, but you had to practice everything. You know, Bud must have had smarter quarterbacks than I did because, you know, <laughs> I heard you say y'all called your own plays, but Warmack and Mildred and, and uh, 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 Dave Davis here. Well, we didn't well, have to call so, them. We had to call them. We wanted to, but we... Huh? Listen to it. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You think he's going to let anybody call oh, the plays? When did that change? Right. When did that change? When did that change? The coaches started calling players. Y'all called every play, right? They did, coach. We let them go left and right. We let them go left and right. Check with me. Check with me left and right. That's all they got to do. Let, let, let me let me explain this. You did have only about 12 plays, so you know it's this is not a grab bag effect. But but let me make a point. Bud had this great simplicity of what he was doing, so it was easy to learn. You know, you got 12 plays and each down and distance or defense situation while you knew what to call. But the uniqueness of what he did was introduce into that offense because it was basically it was running offense. But maybe the greatest collegiate football game I ever saw or the most spellbinding game was in 1950 when Claude Arnold was the quarterback. It was the first national championship and Claude led the team to the national championship. But when they played Texas A&M and I'd solicit the comments of Claude because here's a football game that was lost. Then it looked like it's going to end in a tie and it's not. And then in the last minute of the game, we ended up winning the game and Claude was the quarterback and I it was so spellbinding because the emotions that occurred in that football game in the last quarter were just awesome. But in addition to that, it proved that Claude hit four out of five passes on the last drive. Well, here's a running attack offense that has enough flexibility. And I think, what, what kind of passes were those? 
Well, they were flare passes. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I say, been, been there and done that. There you go. They were short passes. That's right. Just call them something different, right? Oh, man. <laughs> hey, Eddie, uh, are you sure that Claude called, uh, threw that ball or the halfback? <laughs> Well, no, the halfbacks didn't throw those, but when I had to go in, we, we were ahead 28, to, uh, we were behind 28 to 21, and uh, A&M scored, and uh, we missed the extra point, which we would have been tickled to death to settle for the tie, and uh, we got the ball back, we held them, and got the ball back with, I think, about a minute and a half to go, and uh, when I went in, I knew I didn't have to ask what we were going to call or what type of play we were going to run because, you know, you're always apprehensive about throwing the ball out with, with Bud and split T. And I, I, didn't get, get, I didn't throw the ball near as much as I'd like to all the time. But, <laughs> but that's another story. When I, went in, <laughs> when I went in that end of that game, well, I, there was no, no choice, and I didn't have to. Asked Bud what type of thing we were going to do. So we went uh, 69 yards and I think about, about a minute and mm -hmm. scored from uh, the four, pitched out to Leon Heath. He ran over somebody. <laughs> 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 and the stadium, the, the people uh, just sat there. It was just deathly quiet and I've never seen anything like it. People still talk to me about that game and uh, People just sat there for 15 minutes or so. It was just uh, astounding, the, the reaction of the crowd. It kept your winning streak going, right? It was yeah, our, our winning streak winning was 22 or 3 at the time, and uh, w we thought it was over there for a minute, but uh, it was very important to keep that going. Claude, tell them about how you came to Oklahoma. Tell them that story. Well, I came to Oklahoma in 1942. Buddy was at uh, Muskogee, and I was at Okmulgee playing high school in 41. I, I was a freshman at Oklahoma in 42 and uh, played my freshman year and then uh, went to service and played three years. Came back and uh, they were running the split T and Jack Mitchell was the quarterback. He was a great runner, but he was a, he was a halfback playing quarterback, which is apropos at the time. And uh, the quarterback didn't throw but about one little old pass a game. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get that point in on every yeah, story, I, isn't he? I played, played yeah. three years in the service and played there in 42, and uh, uh, I, I thought uh, I didn't want to sit on the bench after, after the, my service career. So I quit and played intramurals for two years, touch football. And uh, by 48, the defenses were starting to catch up somewhat and Bud welcomed me back and uh, uh, I, I just fit in a lot, a lot better and people talked about me being discovered on the intramural field hmm. after I'd played as a freshman in 42 and played in the service for three years but uh, it was a little bit more than intramurals <laughs> so I played in 48 49 and 50 but then I was 26 and uh, then didn't play for a year and then got calls and I went to Canada for three years. So I played off and on till I was 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how old Billy was when he came out of the hooks. <laughs> <laughs> Billy is a freshman, 25. <laughs> you talk, you talk, all, every quarterback wants to throw the ball. It's amazing, even if the guys back and play for Bud too were griping about it. But, well, you know, Barry, but, but, when he finally came out again, he said he did because before they just let him throw once a game, and Bud bumped it all the way up to six times a game. <laughs> a truly play, great man. Mildred <laughs> plays. We play in Southern Cal with Sam Bam Cunningham, John McKay, and that crew. We're playing. Lynn Swan was a sophomore. We're playing them in Norman, 1971, and. Uh, we hang uh, about 38, 35 points on Southern Cal, and we've rushed for over 500 yards, and we're 0 for 0, 0 in passing. <laughs> <laughs> Mildred, in the fourth quarter, we come out of the damn game, and Mildred says, at least let's throw one. I said, okay, we throw the son of a bitch, and it's incomplete. And I said, see there? <laughs> we get made eight more yards. <laughs> we had eight 
eight more yard rushing yards you had, Jack. Pruitt was averaging 9.4 carry, and he wants to throw the football. In, in, the, in the USC game, uh, I had a, a jersey, in the hello, goodbye. It really came from Coach Switzer. And Coach Switzer, see, I got this shirt I want you to wear. And I, I liked it, hello, goodbye. And he said, well, put hello it on. on the front, goodbye on the he back. Said, well, put it, he said, well, put it on and, you know, go to class. You know, so I'm on my way to class, and the reporters find me, and they start taking pictures of me. And I'm like, I'm enjoying all of it. So when I, <laughs> Why is that not I get back to, I get back to, I get back to practice. Coach, what's to say now? You know by now that picture's in the USC locker room, so it, <laughs> it better be hello, goodbye, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Asked uh, the question about Coach Wilkerson. Yeah. Coach Wilkerson was not a guy that you think about to me as being a football coach, and I want to ask. Jerry and Bob and Eddie and Jay. He's from Minnesota. He's an Easterner. He's very dignified. He majored in English, went to Syracuse, modern, uh, got modern English, master in psychology. Played hockey. You don't think about him. He's a very dignified gentleman. And his presence, his, your, the respect for him, and he, he was not, did not scream and holler, but his, the dignity that he had, the respect was there. But he, he wouldn't think the average that he was a, a football coach. His, his father did not want him to coach, I don't think. It was beneath the, the family of their kind of a aristocratic family, as I understand it. But he was just different. And for all you guys that didn't know him, barely knew him, uh, there was something special about that guy in his whole deal. Eddie, expand, or Jay, on what I'm talking about, just the presence of the man and, and his Let me dignity. just add one thing, Jakey, because I, you yeah. know, I was fortunate to play for him, coach for him at Oklahoma, and then I coached with him with the Cardinals. I'm, I've never, ever heard him raise his voice to anybody, never said anything, a vulgar word on a football field. He wouldn't allow it. Had... Uh, nothing bad to say about anybody and was just very much a gentleman all the time and never raised his voice to one player on the football field ever. He just expects you to do your job and we all admired him and respect him a lot. Where did all this all yelling and screaming come from that coaches do? Well, I heard him coach. say damn one time when he, my junior year, that's What'd the first do? time. No. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, that's right. Now you think I'm lying, but I'm telling you. Sir. No, no, we don't think you're lying. We just think you misunderstood. Hey, hey, hey. Well, that's a possibility. Hey, Jerry, let me, let me say, hey, Jerry, let me I, say. Heard him, I heard him say damn when Joe Don Looney hey. was there. <laughs> hey, from what I've heard here, Today, Jim Dent ought to get the death penalty. Jerry, how would you describe him? It was, am I right? That dignity and that presence he had? Well, I mean, just like the, the cursing. I mean, we never had any cursing on the field at all. There's two ways to go. One way you can cuss, another way you can't cuss. They both win. But uh, I sure did appreciate him not cussing me out a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing that... Uh, we played Texas A&M in 51, and Billy ran a punt back right before the half to catch up 7-7. Seven to seven. And we all went in the locker room, jumping up and down, hollering. And, and uh, he came in, and he said, I don't know who in the hell you all think you all are, but uh, you're, getting your, you're getting beat out there tonight. Well, he did say hell. <laughs> you know, I remember the, I, I remember the first time I, I met Bud. Uh, and, and it's really interesting because, you know, coming to the University of Oklahoma, and even at that time, you know, a, a lot of the people that played here, you know, you see the pictures on the wall. You know, you, just, you can't just walk through any one of the buildings, you know, our dressing room, whatever, and not see these guys. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're coming to function at practice and talking to coach and whatever else. And one thing I remember about uh, Coach Wilkinson, I always wanted to meet him, but it was, just, it was just something about him that you felt that you you know, you wouldn't actually just go up and just say and introduce yourself to him. Because uh, some of the functions you'd come back, you'd see him with his wife in their ballroom dancing. And I mean, he's twirling around or whatever else. And, 
And you think, gee, this is, guy, you know, here you are at the University of Oklahoma, and you're scared to talk to him. <laughs> so he's now coaching against, coaching St. Louis, and I'm with Baltimore. And I'm still afraid, you know, he's walking across <laughs> the field. And, you know, you still, because as I say, you know, when you, at the University of Oklahoma, I mean, you know, guys are, I mean, you're just larger than life, basically. And he's walking across the field, and I want to say something to him. So I don't. So finally, I catch a pitch out, and I get run out of bounds over on his side. And I walk back, and I say, Coach, I just want to say, I told him I was, I actually tried to introduce myself to him <laughs> during the game. And he said, look, Joe, I know who you are. It's nice meeting you. It's going on back over <laughs> Uh, a little far. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. I was scared of him. I, mean, I played for him, but I was really no question about uh, scared. Yeah. Not, uh, respected yeah, no him, but we went down to play North Carolina to open the season in 1955, and uh, we were going to go with that two-team concept. You know, one team played half the quarter, and then the other team switched. Well, it's the first game, and he's, he, he's not really sure about us, but uh, so we play the first seven or eight minutes, and, and, and Jerry and his guys stop uh, stop. North Carolina on about our two-yard line. So he says, all right, it's time to substitute this second unit in there. And he, he says, okay, second team line only. Go in. So, and, uh, and so me and the other guy, and I, I knew this was disaster because anybody could take a snap from Jerry Tubbs. I mean, he was the greatest snapper in the world. He didn't have a problem. The snapper on my unit was a boy named Kenny Northcutt, who was a guard playing center, okay? <laughs> and he never learned not to put his feet out behind him. And his whole idea, he's going this way. He's not thinking about the snap. And so I was afraid of Coach Wilkerson, but I ran over to Gomer Jones and said, Gomer, Jimmy Harris will never touch this ball. And he said, what do you mean? I said, there's no way he can take the snap from Kenny because he doesn't do it in practice. Gomer started running towards Bud, and about that time they broke the huddle, snapped the ball, it went straight up in the air, landed <laughs> in the end zone, and North Carolina covered it for a touchdown. <laughs> We never made that same substitution again. <laughs> if our guys went in, we all went in because Jerry was really a fabulous snapper. But, and Kenny was a great player, great linebacker, but he just never was much of a center. If I could make an observation about this awe and reverence that we all had for Bud. And let me tell you something that's helped me. You know, when I read the Bible, it says in their fear of the Lord. It's just talking about the fear of the Lord quite a lot. And that was bothersome to me when I first read that, you know, as a young person and then what I realized is what we're talking about in terms of this awe and reverence that we had for Bud Wilkinson is, I think, comparable sort of suggestion. That when we hold somebody in such awe and reverence, it's really out of just uh, our very positive impression of them and this air about them that we've described as Bud as having had. And, and it uh, was a pervasive thing. I think it... You know what I love watching here? I don't know if you guys, you guys can see it looking across. The, you talk about awe. Look at the younger set here. Point at me. Just, well, <laughs> yeah, all, right. all right, sit back. The younger set here just staring and listening to every word that you fellas have been saying, these stories. I mean, you can see the respect. I mean, Boz, I've been watching you sitting there. I mean, you're just taking every last word in from these fellas. Can't have had a chance to do otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a lot of respect because I can kind of relate this to our... Uh, the Heisman function every year in New York. I had a chance to uh, really get to know a lot of the guys that went before me, especially Mr. Jay Burwanger, who was the first winner in 1935, and uh, guys like uh, Johnny Latner, which is his 50th year coming up. And my 25th year, I thought I'd plug that coach. <laughs> you still going to pay 2000 <laughs> <laughs> Before he goes on, hey, Pruitt, Pruitt and I are sitting on the bus ride over here this morning. I said, I said, Pruitt, watch this. And Cumbie was sitting across the aisle from me, and I said, Greg says, you know, I, I told him I wasn't going to come down here for 2000 I hope you held out for that 10000 I told you to take. And Pruitt said, yeah, I did too. I said, you know, I wasn't going to come. And old Cumbie, Cumbie's sitting there, and he, I knew he got and punched Greg, and he caught it. And, he, and George looked over, and he says, oh, I can see why they paid you all too. But, you know, he says, 
He says, 2,000, that's okay for me. And I said, well, hell, you made two-time All-American, too. Don't sit you back on the bus. You don't ask him for 10,000. Then, then we told him, make sure a little Joe back here slips up and be told, that, hey, how much did you get for doing this gig here? Well, Billy walks in. He hears, we all got 10,000. Billy said, I ain't signed no contracts for balls yet. I ain't signed them all. <laughs> Well, anyway, go on with your story, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> For two oh, set man. up by your buddies. Yeah, 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 I see that. But no, just the respect of the guys that, that paved the way for guys like myself. I really appreciate it. And I was telling Mr. Jay Burwinger uh, before he passed, you know, what was it like for him to win the Heisman Trophy in 1935? And he said, well, I had an article in the paper about this big. <laughs> and then he caught the train, you know, to New York. But, uh... Guys like that, I mean, you know, you can never, ever uh, give uh, a lot of respect and owe a lot of respect to them. I had the pleasure also of meeting Coach Bud Wilkinson because I remember when he coached for the St. Louis Cardinals. And like you say, it's just you don't think of him as, as a football coach, uh, a minister or something yeah. else, but not a football <laughs> coach. But he had this awe about him when he walked, his present and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say something about him, about his, uh, his record that nobody... Nobody will ever match. His record from 48 through 58 was 107 wins and eight losses. And uh, people talk about Bear Bryant and Woody Hayes and people like that of that era. And uh, nobody will ever come close to 107 wins and eight losses in 11 years. Merv, you were jumping out? It's one of the things that these guys right here that played for Barry are a little bit unfortunate that they didn't get to know Coach Wilkinson like our current team gets to know Barry. Because Barry's at practice every day almost. He knows most of them on a first name basis, has a chance to visit with them. They know who he is. Uh, they've learned what a great guy he is and they know what a great coach he was. And unfortunately, these guys, Coach Wilkinson was gone out of the area coaching pro ball and those kind of things. They didn't have the opportunity to get to really to really know him. Some of them were maybe have met him, but that's about it. And that's a shame because uh, that doesn't enable it to be quite tied together as neatly as we'd like for it to be. So just looking around, they got great football players in here, two broadcasters, and Uva. I don't want to. Don't want to. Like, like no. I said, he I said feel that. really. For, I, I'm so proud to be among football players uh, because I never played football. Okay, hey. I did score all the points. Every team needs okay. a kicker. <laughs> we all have to have a kicker. How you, doing? How you doing back there in the cheap seats? I'm just right? taking it all in. It's just uh, so story. much fun. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Uva, tell them about what you told me. You had a couple pops one night, and you were telling me about that play up. <laughs> September the 24th, 1977, oh, in Columbus, job. Ohio. Ohio. I want you to tell them what you said to me, then I'll tell them what I said to you. I Go ahead and tell me. You were, we had a couple of pops, and right. you, what, then what did you say? I, I don't know if I you, remember. No, yeah, you did. <laughs> 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 Too many pops. No, I said, but what you said I, to me, he says, Coach, is one of the biggest plays, excuse me, take a drink, and he said, it's, it's that, uh, was that September 24th, the kick to beat Ohio State at Columbus, 1977. He says, that had to be one of the biggest plays in your career, and then for me, to, it was one of the big wins. And I, you know what my response, Eddie? You know what my response was, Keith? I looked back at uh, Uva, and I said, Uva, I want to tell you something about that. And I said, you know, if... Uh, Thomas Lott hadn't pulled his hamstring in the first quarter, and Billy Sims hadn't injured his ankle in the first quarter. And so we'd hung half an hour on their ass, just like we do everybody else. We wouldn't need your damn field. Goal. <laughs> but what do I see when I, during the timeout, what do I see? He's on his knees, right? <laughs> He's on his knees. Right. Okay, coach. <laughs> we knew you. We needed you when we needed you. That's what I meant. We needed you when we needed you. But really, we got him 22 to nothing in the first quarter. Thomas three inches hamstring. Billy goes out of the ball game, and we turned the ball over, what, about eight times in a row, and we let him back in it, and we needed you. 41-yard field goal to win it. It is long enough. It is good. Wow. With three seconds to play in the game, the Oklahoma team and some of their fans have come onto the field in exultation.
situation as Von Schaumann hit it on the money. Just a few yards away from this exultation, Ohio State players still lying frustrated on the field, pounding the turf in frustration. So that's how it works. But you you always got to have a great, kicker there uh, to save it. That's why you recruit him, man. <laughs> when I that's talk right. to some of the Sooner fans and they bring up the game, they always tell me some great stories. But the best story uh, I was told by one of our coaches, uh, he told his um, girlfriend before we went to Columbus that if we win the game, that um, he was going to marry her. Well, about five years later, I saw him, and he said, I sure wished you would have missed that son of a <laughs> That was one of the biggest plays in Oklahoma football. Well, there's no right? question about it. No question no about question. it. Am I right? No, yeah. wanting to brag about it. I want to put I don't it in place is. and good fun. It was, it was really, yeah. wasn't it? But I'm, I promise you this, if Thomas doesn't re-injure his hamstring and Billy doesn't go out of the game, we're going to hang half a hundred on him. Well, yeah, you know. yeah, got him on the run. Yeah, yeah, we no, hang. we've heard a lot about the backs and the coaches and all these, but what about the real men, the linemen? We hadn't really heard about Gomer Jones and about the big guys, you know, the ones that make the difference. I remember... Well, Tommy McDonald could tell you about what the linemen do for him. Yeah. Let me tell a story about the linemen. All right. If you list the top football players who have played at Oklahoma, Jerry Tubbs would have to be right up in there. And in my senior year, he was a sophomore, and that was the first year or the second year, I guess, that you had to play both ways. And we had Kirk Burris, Buddy's younger brother, who was a real football player. And uh, Bud put Jerry at fullback. And Jerry had never played in the backfield before. One day in the huddle, he says, I never realized you backs ran the ball this far. <laughs> he was out of breath. Out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> but Jerry Tubbs was one of the real football players that I've ever been around in my life. He was a great fullback. Everybody played him out of position. That's right. <laughs> but he, play, he started against Texas so they can play him play linebacker. Well, so the I know the reason play. for it, to get Kirk and Jerry in the game at the same time. And you know, I look around, I see George Cumbie here, and I think about great linebackers, and then uh, Tubbs and Bob Harrison was, was one of the best of all time. But we might ought to call it linebacker U2, man, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I know, you know, uh, you, know you, you really can't talk about, you know, Oklahoma and, and, and Lyman and, and not mention, you know, Lucius, you know, Leroy and Dewey, of course. You know, and I think it was probably, you know, during, you know, our era, those, you know, guys that could probably play both ways, and I don't mean they'd probably end up playing line. You could probably put them in the backfield in some cases because, you know, I thought they were just that good, and especially Leroy. I, the whole four years there, I, I don't know if I ever saw him uh, block one time. Now, Leroy, mm -hmm. Leroy was a tailback in high school, wasn't well, he? They all played back. You see, yeah. Lucius was the tailback, Leroy was the tailback, and Dewey was a fullback. So all three of them played for the Ironheads. You follow them, they were all... All backs. Obviously, they were going to be backs for us. They all thought they were. The Lucius thought, <laughs> Lucius thought he was going to be the next Jim Brown. You know? <laughs> but we knew we were going to squat him down on the ground. But talk about George Cumbie, great linebackers. You mentioned that. George and I were talking about this at, at lunch today. I was sitting beside Brian, and I said, here are two great linebackers that played at Oklahoma in our era. And I said, but George, I had to beat Henderson Junior College in Athens, Texas, to get him because he was at P.K. Gorman High School across town in Tyler, Texas, away from John Tyler and all the other high, four or five A high schools. He's over at this parochial school from LaRue, Texas, a little crossroad community. And I find out about him and I go over and get some film and I take it back and said, Laceville, look at this kid. We hear he's a pretty good linebacker. Well, Laceville goes back there and he said, comes to my office a few minutes later. So you need to come look at this film. Everybody across town recruiting Earl Campbell. We go back there and sit down, and we look at this film. This kid makes every tackle, sideline to sideline, every play, then runs the ball and scores every play. So I said, let's offer this kid, bring him in to visit. We bring him in and uh, offer him a scholarship. Well, I got assigned Kenny King. This, uh, Billy Sim we had a great recruiting year that year. I got Billy Sims out here in Hooks, Texas. I got Clarendon, Texas, Kenny King over, Greg Roberts, the Tabor Twins over here, Thomas Lott down here at San Antonio. And I got to fly around and get all these kids. But Billy's going to want me to sign him at 8 o'clock. Kenny King's going to want me to sign him at 8 o'clock. You've been on that switch before. I said, Billy, 
Let me, I got an idea here. Billy says, why don't you hide out for a couple of days, see? Let all the dust clear and all these guys get signed. Then you get all the attention. No headlines will be on you. Where's Billy? Where's, you know, he buys this. See, boy, that sounds like a good idea. So, so, Billy, so you go get all the headlines. So I go to Clarendon, Texas. I get to sign Kenny King, see? So I'm with Kenny that night, some pool hall in, in uh, Clarendon, Texas. He got his girlfriend. We check into motel. I got connecting rooms. I'm with Eddie and, I mean, Kenny and, they, and uh, that's a recruit. That's his recruit. <laughs> but anyway, the next day I fly yeah. to Tyler, Texas. And uh, George's grandmama, Precious Hart, his granddaddy, it's who he lived with. They're sitting there at a little table in the Tyler Airport. And I land there and I, we taxi up and I get out my papers and run up there and Set down, Steve, and I'm going to sign George Cumbie. Nobody's recruiting. North Texas State, who was it? Hired Payne. Hired Payne and University of Oklahoma. Hmm. He's scared to death. And he says, Coach, I think I'm just going to go to Henderson Junior College. <laughs> I said, you're not coming to the University of Oklahoma? I said, I said, George, I don't care if Texas, Texas A&M, those guys aren't recruiting you. You can play. <laughs> Trust me, you're a, a great player. Well, anyway, I overcome Henderson County Junior College, and we sign it, and he comes to Oklahoma, and uh, obviously we, he was three-time All-American at our place, great player, and uh, you never know where they come from. Yeah, I, I remember uh, you told me that if I went anywhere else, no matter where I went, if we played you, if Oklahoma played you, we were going to beat you. I so said, you might well come to Oklahoma. <laughs> you might well come not, to Oklahoma. Not so. necessarily in that tone of voice. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up in the second quarter, the Selman family has a history at Oklahoma, and what a history it is. Dewey tells a few stories when the legends of Oklahoma football continues on Volume 2.